So tonight I'll be talking about hidden truths behind the queen that you didn't know about. I know that a lot of people, that's what they're paying attention to right now in the news about the queen. I did a video about that uh, last week. And there are reports, to be honest, I don't really uh, believe it, but I am open to the possibility. But when you hear like governors or politicians saying words like, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, you know, Bush said that, uh, Obama said that, <laughs> Billy Graham, Billy Graham uh, mentioned that the queen, that she was very strong in her faith, but it's not really clear if she uh, truly accepted the gospel. So in this case, I just uh, treat her like every other politician, every other ruler in this world. And basically, the Lord sees the rulers and the nations as nothing. That's, That's right. how he deems them as. However, there are four queens that uh, we can look at right here. There are hidden truths about the queen that the Bible gives a lot of uh, interesting studies on. We're going to look at four cases. We're going to look at four cases with hidden truths behind the queen that you probably never heard about before. The first is 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 1. The one queen that the Bible pays attention to is the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1. I'm going to give you all the nuggets about what the Bible says about the queen and some interesting stuff. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 1 reads, And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. Now the first queen that we're going to mention is the Queen of Sheba, and there are people wondering if we go to Song of Solomon chapter 1, but keep your hand there. Keep your hand at 1 Kings 10. Go to Song of Solomon chapter 1. The question in many people's mind is, who is the woman in Song of Solomon? Who is the queen that Song of Solomon adored? Some people have answered, and there are several answers. One of them is the Queen of Sheba, which is very possible because the language of Song of Solomon is very intimate and open. Basically, she is expressing everything in her heart and Solomon is expressing everything in his heart. That's clue number one. Notice at verse one, uh, verse, excuse me, verse 2 and 3, verse 2 and 3, notice that Solomon and the Queen of Sheba basically opened up themselves to each other. So that's clue number one. Clue number two, she is the Queen of Sheba. So she is around a territory that might be a country from Africa. If she is a country from Africa, that's a clue with this bride at verse 5. Verse 5 says, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. So she is a black woman. Uh, Solomon fell in love with this woman. So that's clue number two. Clue number three, Jesus even pointed out the clue that she's from the African region. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. There are several clues to why the Queen of Sheba might be the Queen in Song of Solomon. We looked at uh, several cases. Uh, I'm going to have to write this very small because uh, that way I can fit in all the words. One is the openness, right? Two is because of her ethnicity. 
So it sounds like it's from the African region. Jesus Christ even pointed that out. He called her the Queen of the South. So usually when the Bible talks about the South Territory, it's south of Israel. And that's usually referring to the African continent. So one of the countries in Africa. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Notice in verse 42. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it where she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Notice that she is identified as the queen of the south. Okay, let's go back to Song of Solomon. I want you to go back to Song of Solomon. There's a second possibility to who this woman might be. The second possibility to who this woman might be is from her name. So if you uh, observe her name at the Book of Song of Solomon, she is actually referred to as the Shulamite. Look at chapter 6 and verse 13. Chapter 6 and verse 13. She is known as the Shulamite. So if she is known as the Shulamite, then it shows right here it will not fit with the Queen of Sheba. The Shulamite is from a different terrain. Look at Song of Solomon chapter 6 and verse 13. The Bible reads, Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shulamite? As it were the company of two armies. So this woman is referred to as a Shulamite. And Shul the Shulamite sounds like a Hebrew or Jewish territory. A lot of people don't know, but they do know this. And you've studied this in Genesis. Sometimes when the Bible talks about certain countries or locations or names, if you give it a long passage of time, sometimes people, the way they pronounce things from different countries, they could change just one or two words. So, the Shulamite, if we were to think that it was pronounced differently at a different area, it would be 1 Kings 1. 1 Kings 1. The Shunammite. It could be Shunammite, Abishag, the Shunammite. That's the woman who took care of David. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. And we'll look at uh, chapter 2 actually would be better, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say thee nay, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite to wife. Now this would make a lot of sense because uh, Abishag is known to be a beautiful woman. If we were to go to chapter 1, chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 3, verse 3, about Abishag the Shunammite, so they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel and found Abishag a Shunammite. So notice a Shunammite, referring to the region that she comes from or what ethnicity or what tribe she's from, group of people, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him. So this woman was close to David's household and she took care of David. So Solomon would obviously get to know her as much. As a matter of fact, Solomon's brother Adonijah wanted to marry her. So it would show that there is some kind of attraction with this woman. It's very possible that Solomon may have had an attraction with her as well. As a matter of fact, if we go to chapter 2, verse 17, there seems to be a disdain from Solomon why his brother would try to marry Abishag. So it showed that there's some kind of antagonism here. Perhaps Solomon was protective, protective of her, or he had feelings for her. But one thing he knew is that Adonijah, is, uh, his brother, is up to no good when he wants to marry Abishag. If we look at verse 22, 22, 
And King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, and why dost thou ask Abishag the Shunammite for Ad Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him, and for Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God so, uh, do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. At verse 24, the last part says, Adonijah shall be put to death this day. Notice that Solomon, there seems to be a uh, protection or some sort of uh, feelings that he has toward Abishak. Otherwise, why would he be very protective of her? So that's one other hint. It could be referring to Abishak. However, there are a lot of people who are saying that the Shulamite is mostly referring to as a title. Uh, I'm going to put it like this. If it's referring to this as a title, and mostly if you look at your Bible, a lot of times when they would give the location uh, or the names of people, they would refer to them by their titles. Uh, one example is the Bible never said Pharaoh's name. It called him, the Bible just simply called him Pharaoh. That's not his name, that's the title. The Bible talked about the queen in the African region, and they referred to as Candace. But Candace is not her name. That is actually a title referring to the Kushite kingdom of the, where the Ethiopian unit came from at Acts chapter 8, and that was a title uh, of the queen of Ethiopia at that time. So it can be very, very likely that this is referring to as a title. If this is referring to as a title, I'm going to add more points here. Then what does uh, Shulamite mean? Okay, this is amazing, believe it or not. Solomon, we know, means a man of peace or peaceful, right? I don't know if you knew that. That's what it means. Uh, that's what it meant in Hebrew. But, believe it or not, when you look up the word Shulamite, Solomon is a male form of the meaning for peace. Shulamite is a female form, wow. meaning peace. Believe it or not, that's something in your scriptures. So it could be as a reference to a female gender, whereas in this case, the Bible puts Solomon with a male gender. If that's the case, that it's referring to her title, then perhaps we can go back to the Queen of Sheba and it would match with her. The reason why it would match probably more strongly to her than Abishag Remember, Song of Solomon plainly said that she's black. So Song of Solomon plainly said that she's black. Hence, the Queen of Sheba would be a stronger candidate then. She would be a stronger candidate. But we don't know for sure who the Queen is in Song of Solomon. However, there is no doubt the Bible puts a lot of nuggets here and typology with this woman. One thing is in Song of Solomon, this woman, she pictures the bride of Jesus Christ, the church. And then the man, Solomon, pictures Jesus Christ. It has been uh, famously, uh, basically, nearly all scholars will agree that Song of Solomon in Christianity is referring to the relationship of Christ and the church. If you look at Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 1, it's referring to Jesus Christ. That's why we sing the song about him. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Another thing to know about this woman, if you look at chapter, si uh, chapter 1 verse 6, chapter 1 verse 6, Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. 
they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard uh, have I not kept. Observe that uh, she is uh, referred to as a black woman, but she says, look not upon me, as if there's uh, shame with her ethnicity. However, believe it or not, if we go to Acts chapter 8, jump to Acts chapter 8, the first person, the very first person that ever heard the gospel for the Christian church was a black person. Look at Acts chapter 8. We will read in verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some of other men. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Notice the first case of a person confessing his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. The Christian gospel is not doing good works, and even in this case, it's not water baptism. Amen. It showed he can't get water baptized until he got the gospel right. What's the case here? Basically, he confessed that I believe what Jesus did on the cross to save me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's his confession here. There is no other person that ever did some, a statement like that, a confession like that. This is the first case of your Christian gospel here. Well, isn't it strange that the Lord uh, would put a black person for the typology? Why would he do the black person for the typology? We're going to go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Because the reason why is when we look at Genesis chapter 9, Ham, who is the father of the African race or the black people, had received the curse for his sin. And because of that, the Lord wanted to give you a great picture. A picture of people must realize that one, they're under a curse of sin and that he can transform it. Secondly, that uh, they are a servant of servants. But people have so much pride they don't realize that. So whether you believe it or not, before you got saved, uh, you were a slave. You were a servant. And when you get saved in Jesus Christ, you become a servant of Jesus Christ right. instead. So only a person who comes uh, in as a servant will be able to uh, be more receptive to the gospel. If we look at uh, Genesis chapter 9, in verse 25, the Bible said, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So notice right here that uh, in this passage that Canaan from Ham's lineage received a curse and then he became known as servant of servants. But what the Lord does is go to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. He transform it and then he washes us clean. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 26, Ephesians chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 26. The Bible says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Notice not having what? Spot. Or a wrinkle, so nothing black in the church. So the church, who is a picture of the wife of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ ignores the blackness or the spots and cleanses the church with his precious blood. So there's everything in the typology right here. Uh, what God wants to do is to give you a typology that uh, the black people represent and picture a lost person becoming a saved child of God. The Lord never chose an Asian. The Lord didn't choose a white person. The Lord choose, chose black people. So in this passage, it's very humbling, and it's a, quite an honor that, the, uh, that in this passage, the Lord would put in Song of Solomon a black woman as a picture of the bride of Jesus Christ 
and then also the first case of New Testament Christianity from the Gospel of an Ethiopian eunuch because he wanted to show you a picture from all of this. Let's also return to 1 Kings again. Let's keep studying this Queen of Sheba. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 9. Another thing about the Queen of Sheba. 1 Kings chapter 10, excuse me, not 9. 1 Kings chapter 10. Notice the statement sounds like a person who receives salvation. If she pictures a Christian church, it shows a statement as if she receives salvation. Notice in verse 7, Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. That's where you get the phrase, the half has not yet been told. And there's a hymn that goes, "'Tis marvelous and wonderful what Jesus has done for this soul of mine. The half has never yet been told." Amen. We see a picture here of a statement of salvation. Another case is when we go to the book of Matthew, chapter 12 again, Matthew chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 3. Matthew 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want, to, I want to make sure everyone doesn't catch sickness, but uh, are, are women cold here or are they okay? Okay then, uh, just uh, can you raise up the temperature just by one degree? Yeah, by one degree, thank you. All right then, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 12, and then I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Actually, I think it's chapter 2, excuse me, it'll be chapter 2, not chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 12, notice what Jesus said about the Queen of Sheba. He said in verse 42, The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Notice Jesus Christ typified himself with Solomon. If Solomon's lover, as Song of Solomon, is referring to the Queen of Sheba, it would make sense that she would typify the church. But in this case, she does typify the church because the Queen of Sheba, notice, will be at the Day of Judgment judging the unbelievers. That's what Jesus said right here. That picture is the Christian church because we will judge. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice that we will be the ones who will actually judge at verse 15. We'll look at verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Word of God reads, But he that is spiritual, okay, you are saved, spiritual Christian, it says, judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Notice that we have the power to pronounce judgment. Look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 6 and verse 2. A lot of pictures here with the Shunammite woman, the, or Shulamite, excuse me, and the Queen of Sheba. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice that the saints are supposed to judge the world in verse uh, where's that verse? It was somewhere here. Two, thank you. Two. Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now that's fascinating. You're going to be judging angel, angels and the world as well. Okay. Let's go to the book of Esther, chapter 1. We'll go to the book of Esther. Chapter 1. The next place, the next queen that we're going to enter into right here is Queen Esther. Queen Esther. Now, who does she typify? She does not typify the Christian church. Let me repeat that again. She does not typify the Christian church in this case. Now, King Ahasuerus, we can see a picture here that 
he represents uh, basically God the Father or God himself. Okay, then wouldn't it make sense that Queen Esther would be the bride of God, referring to the Christian church? Actually, no. Queen Esther, she's going to picture here the nation of Israel. Queen Esther pictures the nation of Israel. You might say, why is that? Because Esther is speaking for her people, the Jews. And there's a lot of rich pictures here. There's no doubt when you look at the book of Esther, the typology is more strong with the Jews in the tribulation more than the Christian church in the church age. Now, I'm sure you can pick up some pictures where Esther can typify the church. However, if you look at the scriptures, way too many references where Esther would strongly depict Israel. Because of Vashti, that's one big clue, Vashti. Vashti, she pictures the Gentiles. Now notice that this is a Gentile queen at Esther chapter 1. Esther is a Jewish queen. Notice that the king put cast aside the Gentile and goes to the Jew. Did you hear that? The king cast aside the Gentile, goes to the Jew. Look at Esther chapter 1. Notice in verse 11, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Now, keep your hand here. Go to chapter 2. We're going to look at a lot of pictures here. Look at chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 4. Verse 4. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. Well, who is this woman? This is Esther. When we look at, uh, let's see right here, we're going to jump to 17, 17. The Bible reads, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So notice that the king puts the crown upon a Jew and takes it away from a Gentile. Yeah. Now, is it true that the Lord, okay, crown, right? As if the crown is like an election. You know that? A crown is like you're electing someone, giving someone power. Go to Romans 11. Romans 11. People are ignorant of this. People think that the Jews are forever cast aside and we've replaced them permanently. But no, notice Romans 11 shows that the Jews were temporarily cast aside and only partially too, yeah. and he goes to the Gentile. But what happens is, God warns, the Gentile's time will come to an end as well, and that he's going to cast off the Gentile and return, go to the Jew. Amen. So the election that was taken from the Jew given to the Gentile, God's going to take that election away from the Gentile as well one day, and give it to the Jew. You might say, why is that? Look at the Gentile nations. You think that they're godly? They're a bunch of Christians? Spit on Jesus' face, man. They deserve to be rejected by God. God should take away the election from them. So notice what God does with his election. He switches it from the Gentile to the Jew. Uh, we're going to return to Esther because there's a lot of nuggets here, but keep Keep your hand there, and then Romans 11, I'll read the passage. The Bible says at verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? That's the Jews. God forbid, but rather through their fall, the Jews, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, 
how much more their fullness. So notice the Jews cast aside, goes to the Gentiles. Now notice right here what God warns. Verse 18, he warns the Gentiles, boast not against the branches. So that's referring to the Jews. So don't boast against the Jews. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Verse 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, Jews, take heed, lest he also not spare thee, the Gentiles. Read verse 23. And they also, the Jews, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be what? Graft in. For God is able to graft them in again. Yeah. God's going to graft in the Jews. Verse 25 is super duper plain. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Okay, don't be ignorant. Keep your ears open. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See, the Gentiles will fulfill their time. Their time will be up. God's waiting for it to be full. And then after that, he's going to go to the Jews. He says that the Jews are only cast aside till then. Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. Notice he goes back to the Jews. He goes back to the Jews. Verse 28, look, this election is considered given to the Jews. 28, as concerning the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sakes. Well, that's plain. But as touching the election, see, the election right here. God's going to make sure that they get elected. Mm -hmm. They are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God can't take it back. God can't take it back. He made a promise. So Vashti pictures that well. If she pictures the Gentile, look at this Gentile. Esther, this is really good right here. Okay, we're going to go to Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1. There are several things where we can see the church is pictured in Vashti. And I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. I'm going to go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 is the classic passage, you might notice, for the Christian church, the bride of Jesus Christ. If we were to go to Esther, Chapter 1, notice right here in verse, let's see, 11, the king wanted what? To bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. Notice that the wife of Jesus Christ is supposed to be fair and beautiful. If we were to look at verse 27, verse 27 of Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Notice he's going to present this woman, the church, to himself, right? Notice the picture right here, the king wants to present this woman at verse 11. Now let me ask you this question. If God's going to present you his bride as his woman, what does that mean? He's calling you to come to him. Yeah. And when he calls you to come to him, that means you're going to go to his place where he lives, yes, sir. and then we can start the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Okay, here's a picture of the rapture. But notice what the Gentiles do, the Gentile queen. They reject the rapture call of the king. That's right. And because of that, they're left behind or cast out. Wow. And isn't that what God does with the Gentile nations in the tribulation? Yeah. They miss out the rapture call. They're going to join the United Nations under the Antichrist. And then they are cast aside from Israel. Let's go back here. Let's go back. 
verse 11 of Esther chapter 1. He's calling her, right, to come to him. But then notice verse 12, but the Queen Vashti, Gentiles, refused to come at the king's commandments by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very what? Wroth. Wroth. So notice that the wrath of the king falls on her. The tribulation is a timeline of the wrath of God. And the wrath of God falls upon the Gentiles during the tribulation. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, as well as the book of Revelation chapter 11. Look at Revelation chapter 11, and then we'll also go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Some of you might say, Pastor, you're going through a lot of verses tonight. Good. Good, because this is called a Bible study. I will feed you, all right? That's my job. I am going to feed you. I'm not going to feed you a screen. I'm going to feed you the words of God. And like the other churches, they just post things on a screen and people don't turn to the scriptures. I want you to turn to the scripture. Look at it yourself. Write down notes. I want you to actually learn. Feel like you're learning something. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. Notice that the wrath is during the timeline of the tribulation. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Okay, so during the timeline of the tribulation, God's wrath is poured out. But notice that the Christians, those who are saved, those who are saved, miss out this wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. Verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that our timeline is not appointed for wrath, when God's wrath is poured out during the tribulation. This is a rapture because look at verse 10, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, see, whether we are alive or we're dead, notice we shall live together with Him. We're going to still go up together and be with God. So whether you're alive or dead, that's a rapture. All right, we see a lot of pictures here. Go back to Esther again and chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. I've got a lot, lot more. All right. Got a lot, lot more. I didn't even cover the other two yet. I hope you're getting fed. You're enjoying something. Esther chapter 2. If she pictures the tribulation Jew, I want you to go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Two places, Matthew 25, as well as Esther chapter 2. Notice that Esther, she had to go through an ordeal. While she was going through this ordeal, she was going through this ordeal with a bunch of virgins. The virgins and Esther are going through an ordeal until the king is able to call them. And when the king calls them, he's going to see if uh, he can find grace and favor with you. Because there's going to be virgins that don't please the king. That is the tribulation. The Bible talks about that there are ten virgins. Five of them wise, five foolish. The king calls them up. And notice that there are virgins who miss out because the king didn't find, or the, the person in charge of the wedding, the groom, did not find favor with them in his eyes. Let's look at Esther chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse 9. This is talking about Esther, all right? And the maiden pleased him, the king, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to, uh, her, to her. Actually, this is referring to Hegai, keeper of the women, excuse me, not the king. Now, when we look at verse, uh, let's see, 15, 15, or we're going to, because I want to cover virgins here, 17 would be better, yeah. 17 would be better. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. Notice that? The virgins missed out, but Esther 
was able to go in. If you look at verse 14, the last part of verse 14, notice it's like a rapture call. And that she were called by name. Yeah. You see that? God calls them out by name. So notice a rapture here. So pe that people don't get confused, there are two raptures. One, a rapture for the Christian church, that is before the tribulation wrath, where we miss it out. The second thing is for the Jew who endures the tribulation wrath and eventually gets raptured out. Look at Matthew 25. Notice this rapture call. Matthew chapter 25. Notice in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Notice that there. Just like the virgins in the book of Esther. We'll read verse 2. And five of them were wise and five foolish. Look at verse 10. And while they went to buy, the five foolish ones, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered uh, and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour, what? Wherein the Son of Man cometh. So see, this is talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, the rapture. And he actually rejects these virgins who want to go in, but he doesn't receive them. He doesn't find favor with them. Another one, notice that the Jew here, Esther the queen, go to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, and go to Esther chapter 2 and verse 10, verse 10. So Esther pleased the king, right? There is one thing that Esther had to do. She had to be in hiding as a Jew. She had to be in hiding as a Jew so that the Antichrist doesn't get her and is unable to kill her. Okay, ready for this? Okay, <laughs> Esther chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Notice right here, Esther hid her Jewish roots, her Jewish ethnicity. Now notice the Antichrist here. Go to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. Verse 6. This is Haman. Haman is a type of the Antichrist. Haman is a type of the Antichrist. Notice that he was so angry that he declared annihilation and persecution against the Jewish people. However, Haman had no idea about Esther. Esther survived, hid herself. She hid away. That way, the Antichrist, or a.k.a. Haman, won't catch her. Chapter 3, verse 6, And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. Now I want you to jump to Esther, chapter 7. Esther chapter 7. Notice that Haman had no idea. No idea about Esther's ethnicity. So he got scared. The Bible reads in verse 6, And Esther said, The adversary and enemy. Oh, kind of like your adversary, the devil, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, right? An enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to, queen, to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Notice right here that Haman wanted to survive and to escape. I mean, if he knew that, he wouldn't have pronounced such a dumb move about annihilating the Jews. 
Hence, uh, we see here that the Antichrist, at Matthew 24, he does start a persecution of Jews, and Jews, in order to survive, they have to hide. Matthew chapter 24. Notice verse 15. When ye, shall therefore sh uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, then let them which be in Judea, the Jews, flee into the where? Mountains. They have to hide. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now notice that there, it's such a horrible time that the Jews have to run away. They're going to have to hide out in the mountains. And God described it as survival at verse 22. Notice this sounds like survival. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Notice that they're considered the elect, right? Yeah. So notice that they're considered as the chosen or elected, like Esther elected as queen. For her, uh, for her sake, for the Jews' sake, the elect's sake, they are spared. They are spared. We see a lot of pictures here with uh, Esther and the Jewish people, as well as Haman being the Antichrist. Okay, we're going to go to Psalm 45. And this is cool. Psalm 45, and I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 3. I want you to go to Psalm 45. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Queen of the gold of Ophir. Who in the world is that, right? Who in the world is that? The queen of the gold of Ophir. Believe it or not, secular scholars even agree with this. And Jews, and as well as Christians, agree that Psalm 45, the queen of the, uh, who has the gold of Ophir is as follows. Okay, here we go. Psalm 45. Notice in verse 9, King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Who is this queen that has the gold of Ophir? This queen of the gold of Ophir is referring to the Christian church, actually. It is a direct reference to the Christian church. That's a prophecy. The entire book of Psalm 45, the entire chapter in Psalm 45 is referring to the Christian church. Yeah. Now you might see it might be referring to a normal queen. No, that's not the case because the king here is referring, which secular scholars, Jewish rabbis, and even Christians agree with, is referring to a messianic figure. Wow. It's referring to the Messiah, the king. Look at verse, uh, verse 3, 3. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. See, this king don't sound like a normal human. This sounds like Jesus Christ. Aren't there passages about the messianic king ruling in truth, meekness, and righteousness? Keep reading. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. How about that? They fall before him. Now, verse 6 is good. Thy throne, O oh what? God. They call this messianic figure God. Jesus is God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now, this is an excellent passage to prove Jesus is God. Or at least, the Messiah is God. Now, you want it even better? Here, I'll give you something better. Verse 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, speaking to the Messiah, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Wh what? Trinity. 
Trinity. The Messiah is referred to as God, and then His God is referred to as God. That's the Trinity, the Father and the Son. So this is an excellent passage in your Old Testament to prove the Trinity to Orthodox Jews. An Old Testament passage. That's something you want to mark down. This is an excellent passage to prove that the Messiah, you don't even have to say Jesus, but the Messiah is God. The Messiah is God. And there is a Trinity because he's called God. That's crazy. So this is clearly Jesus Christ. We can agree with that, right? Man, there's so many great references here. One, it's identifying the king. The king, as agreed by nearly all scholars, is referring to the Messiah. We know him as Jesus Christ. The Messiah is referred to as God. That's very strong. We saw passages on the Trinity. Now, this is referring to God's wife then. Who is God's wife? It's the church. Who is the wife of Jesus Christ? This is more specifically Jesus, right? Who is the bride of Christ? That's referring to the church. Keep reading. Notice, king's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand, the king, did stand his wife, the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, so it's now speaking to that queen, and consider and incline thine ear, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. Now, isn't that really cool right there? Notice right here that the Christian church, if they are referring to that queen, they are to forsake their own people in order to follow Jesus Christ. Now, uh, keep your hand here. Go to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew, chapter 10. Look at this. Matthew, chapter 10. When you became a saved Christian, you, you got family members separating from you. You notice that? Look at Matthew, chapter 10. The Bible points out how uh, we lose everything for following Jesus Christ. In verse 35 through 36, For I am come to set a man, that's Jesus, he divides, to set a man at variance against his father. Psalm 45 says, Forget your father's house. And the daughter against her mother. Notice in Psalm 45, we're referred to as the daughter at verse 10, Psalm 45, 10. Uh, notice verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and that he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Why? Because Psalm 45 says, Hey daughter, forget your own people, your father's household. That's Psalm 45.10. And then, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, calls her to follow him. Verse 11, if you do so, verse 11, so shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy what? Lord. How can you get around this? Notice right here, this is referring to God Almighty himself. The king is the Lord, and we're going to be, and worship thou him. We're worshiping him. Isn't that strong? I don't care what you said. The Messiah is God right here. How are you going to get around this? Verse 13. So what is this queen in gold of Ophir? Why would the Bible say that? Because, verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She has her own clothing, and it's gold. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. At the judgment seat of Christ... You're getting gold. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now there are three passages. Revelation 2. I want you also to go to Revelation 2. And then also Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to lay your works on the fire. And the fire is going to try your work. And it's going to produce the fine gold that you need. 
And this fine gold is not only used as your treasure, but it's also used as your clothing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Okay, look at Revelation 2, your hands there. Revelation chapter 2. Actually, it'll be chapter 3. Chapter 3, sorry about that. Chapter 3. Notice in verse 17, God's warning them. Look at chapter 3, verse 18, 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That's referring to 1 Corinthians 3, right? That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be what? Clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. The church is clothed in white garments, but the Bible also says this white garment is actually gold in the book of Psalm. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. The wife of Jesus, it's very plain, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Okay, now I want you to go to the book of Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47. And then I want you to go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. Go to Isaiah 47. And then I want you to go to Revelation 17. And we're going to be covering the last queen here. The last queen that the Bible actually does make mention. And actually it is not a good mention. We are going to be covering the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible does pay attention to her. Recognizes her as a queen, but recognizes her as an evil queen, not as a good queen. The Bible actually points out a lot about the, uh, some interesting things about this queen. Let's start off with Revelation chapter 17. This is plainly the Catholic Church. The Bible says in verse... Uh, Five, five, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Notice that she is a queen because kings submit to her. At verse two, verse two, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay, how do we know that this is uh, referring, this Babylon here is referring to the Roman Catholic Church? Well, one, it's, not, uh, it's definitely not Israel. It's definitely not uh, referring to America. Because if you look at verse 18, 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. It's a city, not a state or a country, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's one city that rules over kings. That's clue number one. If you study a lot of the uh, Vatican stuff, the dark stuff behind the scenes, the hidden information, the Jesuits have hands everywhere among the kings of this earth, amongst the United Nations. Vatican City itself is its own political state and power, and at the same time, it is religious. It is a church. There's no other organization like that that's both religious and political and consider its own independent uh, organization or state. Vatican City is its own organization. Washington, D.C. ain't like that, neither is Jerusalem. But Vatican City is its own. If you study, if you study the Vatican City, it deems itself as its own country, basically. Its own political power. And If you look at verse 4, it's plainly the Catholic Church. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Who dresses up in purple and red? And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Who decked themselves with uh, gold, silver, and precious stones? Priest. And who makes a big deal about a cup? 
All right, notice that having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. That ain't the Statue of Liberty. That's, that's like a torch. That ain't a cup. All right? What church makes a big deal about a cup? That's the Catholic Church. There's no doubt about that. Even more so, who's the one that spilled martyrs' blood that there's literally a book titled Fox's Book of Martyrs, and those martyrs are referring to that Roman Empire, yeah. from pagan Rome to religious Rome, the Catholic Church. Revelation 17, verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. That's plainly the Catholic Church. Even more so, Rome is known as a city on seven hills, right? So look at verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. That's really plain. Even more so, if we're going to go back here, the Bible says at verse 1, Revelation 17, 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So she's sitting on waters. Look at verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitude and nations and tongues. So when this woman sits on the waters, it's supposed to picture the Catholic Church that's sitting and ruling over the kings and the nations. This is really plain. In the Catholic Jubilee of 1825, Pope Leo XII struck out a medal honoring himself. When he struck out a medal that uh, honored himself, because he's a very humble man of God, loves the Lord Jesus Christ, that people kiss his feet out of pure humility, the medal had the church pictured as a woman holding a cup in the hand with the Latin inscription, Sedit Super Universum. Universum. What does that mean? That means the whole world is her seat. There's no doubt. This, this is clearly the Roman Catholic Church. It's plain as day. There's no other way around it. All you have to do is look at uh, the Jubilee of 1825 where the Pope struck out a coin of himself. What's that? Oh, look. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My bad. Okay. <laughs> there is a Christian church that's trying to become the Catholic yeah. Church, so that matches up pretty well. <laughs> there are too many references here, known as the city, and the Vatican is its Vatican City is its own power. Mm -hmm. It's its own independent country and state. Second thing. Uh, we see the cup, and then the clothing, and then seven hills. There's a lot. There's just too much here. But another one. Notice that the Word of God describes the Roman Catholic Church in chapter 18. Chapter 18 is continuing on with this whore of Revelation. The Bible says in verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Now notice this matches to a T, Isaiah 47. Go to Isaiah 47. I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of what? Babylon. The church, Mary, right, or their Semiramis, is known as the what? Virgin Mary. They insist she has to be a virgin. Christians don't believe in that. She wasn't forever a virgin. So that's strange. But even more so, look at verse 5. five. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. Notice that matches really well with Revelation chapter 18 and verse 7. She insists that she's going to sit a queen, queen and be no widow. 
But over here, they said that, uh, no, when you sit down, you're no longer going to be called the Lady of Kingdoms. This matches uh, her really well. As a matter of fact, if this all matches up with her, notice verse 9. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. See, she's going to become a widow. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries. She's known for her sorceries and widowhood. We looked at Revelation chapter 18 and verse 7. She's going to become a widow. And also notice right here that she is known for her sorceries at verse 23. 23. The last part of verse 23 says, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. They all match up really well. This is no doubt referring to the same woman in Revelation 17, 18. What's really strange is she calls herself, at verse 5, she calls herself the lady. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. She calls herself the lady. What religion refers to their Semiramis idol goddess as Lady, Our Lady, Our Lady, The Lady, Our Lady, Our Lady. Yeah. That's really disturbing. Amen, right here, the Bible says plainly, The Lady of Kingdoms. Didn't you know that one time the Catholic Church, they actually allow that title. And the title that she is known as is The Lady of Kingdoms. She's known as The Lady of Kingdoms. Uh, if you look up uh, that time when so-called Mary started to give the quote about herself, it will turn your blood cold. And the Lady of Kingdoms supposedly uh, told the people that because I am uh, the lady, uh, because I am the lady, you will refer to me as the Lady of Nations. That's what the the apparition is supposed to be. It was referring to Ida Pierderman of Amsterdam, Netherlands. But because the Catholic Church, they're getting a lot of heat about the Marian apparitions, they're trying to avoid that. However, they allow the title, the Lady of All Nations. The quote, I think, if I still have it, I lost the quote here. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to give another quote from the Lady. Here's some weird stuff, supposedly. This is what the Lady said. Before Our Lady appeared to the three shepherd children, the angel of peace visited them. The angel prepared the children to receive the Blessed Virgin Mary. He told them, Make of everything you can sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners proper way to receive our Lord in the Eucharist. Wait, uh, Christianity don't practice sacrifice. What church practices that? And insists it's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Our Lady stressed the importance of praying the rosary in each of her apparitions. How long? <laughs> it's, so, it's really hilarious how long. They, they point out the timeline Stress the importance of praying, Our Lady, stress the importance of praying at least five decades of the rosary daily. <laughs> now, you know, they're really stretching things here when they're adding this kind of stuff. This, uh, these quotes can be summarized and found at www.fatima.org, and that's for the Lady of Fatima. Let's look at Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, and we'll call it a night. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Now this is really plain as day. What's plain as day is that the people call their idol, their female idol in the Catholic Church, Queen of Heaven. They, they take that title with pride. How can you take it with pride? And the Bible already warns you about the Queen of Heaven. That's a pagan idol. You know, the Catholic Church, they bake, notice how they make these cakes, right? These wafers in front of it. Notice, nothing changed at Jeremiah chapter 7. This is so weird. 
the Jews, they bragged and boasted about uh, making cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Look at verse, uh, let's see here. I am not myself today, but 18, thank you. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need their what? Dough, Dough to make cakes to the what? Queen. Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings. Who does drink offerings? Mm -hmm. Come on. That's the Catholic Church. Unto other gods that they may provoke me to happiness or anger. Okay. Anger. That's... That's ridiculous that the Catholic Church would proudly call her the Queen of Heaven. The Bible says there's judgment on her. So there's no doubt that this queen, this last queen that we look at, the Queen of Heaven, is condemned in Scripture and is not a positive reference. It's certainly not referring to Mary because Mary didn't exist that time. So don't put poor Mary into there. This Queen of Heaven is referring to some pagan, dark, female deity that the devil wants to use, and one day she has a play in the tribulation. Now, here are some hidden truths in the Bible that you probably didn't see before, and the Lord has shown you a lot of these interesting pictures and verses and connections about these four queens. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearer and that we learned a lot, especially concerning about the queens, how the church is pictured, how much we're grateful that uh, you're a great God and you're a great husband uh, and that we've seen some enlightening things and further truths, especially Psalm 45 where we can use that to witness to fellow Jews and the warnings about the corruption of the Catholic cult. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.